Hi, folks. I'm Dan Vergano. I'm a science reporter at USA Today, and I'm here with Sally Sautel, uh, the author of, with Scott Lillenfeld, of uh, Brainwashed, uh, how, mindless, how we are seduced by mindless neuroscience. Uh, and the first question I want to ask you uh, is, uh, what was the real title of this book? What, I understand you actually had a uh, different title in mind when you started out. Well, no, I didn't start out with this title in mind, but I came to it uh, with the, with the uh, best-selling status of this trilogy called um, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. So I thought Fifty Shades of Grey Matter might be, <laughs> might be compelling, but we got brainwashed. So uh, beyond wanting a, a great title, uh, what sort of was your uh, motive here? What were you trying to tell people by writing Brain? Well, uh, actually, the, the, the Fifty Shades, though, and the Brainwashed, uh, the subtitle being The Seductive Appeal, <coughs> we wanted to talk, wanted to talk about what's probably the greatest scientific achievement of modern time and, and how it's brain science, neuroscience, and how it's moved out into the public sphere and how brain imaging in particular, uh, fMRI, functional magnetic imaging, most people are familiar with brain scans, mm -hmm. these technicolor pictures of, of the brain, um, how, and, and that in particular because we consider that the uh, kind of the, the signature tool of, of modern neuroscience. So how, what was the trajectory of that technology out of the lab and out of the clinic and into the public sphere? What's that movement been like, and, and what are the implications for society? Right, and, and obviously, this is a critique of, of some of that movement, right? Do you, you see some uh, uh, shortcomings in how this is presented, you know, maybe starting with uh, uh, what people are seeing as these hot brains or brain flashes and what it really means? Exactly, and that's, that's a critical distinction, where this is not a critique of a magnificent science and a, a technology that is dazzling to the point of frankly, mind-boggling. It's, it's a critique of, of uh, premature application of this technology, of reading too much into what it can tell us about our, in, our mental states, what we want, what we like, what, we, what we're going to do, whether we're going to use cocaine, whether we can't, whether we're, whether we're, gonna, whether we're lying, mm -hmm. um, whether we had a guilty state of mind. You know, can it really do these things? Because it's, it's already starting to be pressed into service in, in those arenas. Right. In the, in the book itself, you kind of march through different areas you see as problems. Um, probably the one we should talk about is, is addiction, uh, where you, know, you see a lot of uh, problems with how some of this result is, results are being used to present uh, addiction as a brain disease. Yeah, that's, that is a good place to start because that's really the reason that uh, my colleague and I um, wrote this book. My colleague's a psychologist at, at Emory, um, and he was, we were, about four years ago, we were talking and drinking, actually, and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, he was sort That's of how being, ideas happen? I'm shocked to hear it. <laughs> he even talked about, uh, gee, are we losing the mind in the age of brain science? Because uh, psych psychology, which is unfortunately often seen as, as soft, it can be very hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very rigorous discipline, the way Scott and, and uh, academic psychologists, experimental psychologists pursue it. Um, <clears throat> but it seemed to be almost getting no respect, yeah. getting left in the dust by the, the sexiness of, of brain scans, when often it was the psychological investigations that could tell people more about human behavior. And uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but that distinction was getting lost. So he was getting frustrated about that. Meanwhile, I'd been frustrated for quite a while mm -hmm. <laughs> over this formulation of addiction as a, um, a quote, chronic and relapsing brain disease. Now, I'm a, a psychiatrist, and I work part-time in a methadone clinic, so I see a lot of addicts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't, don't think of them as brain disease patients. They don't think of themselves that way. When you think of a brain disease, you think of a condition like <clears throat> multiple sclerosis, um, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, the kinds of conditions that can't be modified by a person's desire to make themselves well. And that, that was one of many reasons why I always thought the, the, that uh, the brain disease uh, model was misleading, mm -hmm. because it implied that 
it was a condition like others that are involuntary, and there is a voluntary dimension. Now, I'll get back to that. I certainly don't mean that people can just stop in the middle of it. It's easy to stop in the middle of a crack binge and get up and walk away. Not at all. It's, 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 it's soul-wrenching for people to, to quit a, a, mm -hmm. a bad addiction. There's no question about that. But, um, but it is misleading, I think, to call it a brain disease for that reason. Also, when we think of something as, a, as an affliction of the brain, the material brain, the physical brain, we think that the cure is, is medication or some sort of intervention uh, along those lines. And also, it's, um, it's not helpful. Just practically speaking, it's just not the helpful level of analysis to think about addiction. There's no question that addiction plays out <coughs> in the brain. Why else would people use drugs? And it's fascinating research about you know, the reward system and, the, and, and, and um, elements of memory and desire and motivation. Um, that's all um, very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And research on that is going, going to tell us a lot about those mechanisms. But when you're with a patient, um, uh, you don't address him at the level of his neurons. You, you talk with him. And that's, in fact, how people also get better from mm -hmm. their drug problem, is the recognition that people use drugs, frankly, for reasons. And, um, and in fact, drug use often starts out as, as an adaptation. Of course, it gets out of hand, and, um, and that's why often people come, come for help, because they can't do it themselves. But, but all our treatments uh, that are, all the most successful treatments really are uh, motivational and behavioral. And um, they're, they're, it's not a behavior that we address exclusively or even largely to, at, at the level of the brain in any direct way. Mm -hmm. but, but this is science, right? Uh, you know, they put five addicts in a machine and they get a nice picture out at the end. And uh, you know, what are those pictures really telling us, if, if anything? Oh, well, those pictures, in fact, they're ext extremely compelling. And they're also very, I mean, they're true in that, um, in, mm -hmm. if, for example, you take people who've, um, who have a cocaine problem and then you put them in a PET scanner, which is a, diff a, a kind of brain imaging. Mm -hmm. Technology it's all brain scans in the newspaper level. Okay, so well, we'll, we'll <laughs> just, we can get to that. <laughs> um, and then you, uh, it, while they're being imaged, while their brain's being imaged, they're presented with pictures of people um, smoking cocaine, preparing to use cocaine, um, and then they're also exposed to pictures of little kittens or completely neutral mm -hmm, phenomena. Mm -hmm. and, and you will see a great activation in the, in the element and aspects of the, uh, re the reward circuitry, and which is completely consistent, or in the case of PET, a rush of, of uh, dopaminergic activity, mm -hmm. uh, which is completely consistent with the kind of anticipation uh, that you might expect from someone who, who has been compelled to and enjoyed a behavior that, that they now watch others engaging in. And you wouldn't see that um, in a person, for example, who never had a cocaine problem. So, so that's all very real. The question is, so there's no question the brain has changed. And that's, in fact, what the um, kind of the rationale for calling it a brain disease is, that the brain has changed in the course of developing an addiction problem. And there's no question about that. The brain has changed. That's why these choices that people still have are still constrained. Um, there's no question about that. But just because there are changes in the brain doesn't mean that a person is not responsive to foreseeable consequences and rewards. And we'd never say that about a person with Alzheimer's. You, you would never take a person with Alzheimer's and say, you know, if you can keep your dementia from progressing, we'll give you a million dollars or we'll shoot you. <laughs> It, it just doesn't work. Right. An autonomous disease does not work that way. But one with voluntary dimension, and by voluntary I mean a behavior that can be modified by its consequences. Mm -hmm. I'm not referring to how easy or hard that is to do. In the case of addiction, it's often very, very hard, hard to do. But, um, but, at, but that's, why, um, that's why seeing something in the brain doesn't necessarily 
mean that it's an, it's uh, the, the behavior that we assume flows from it is involuntary or inexorable in any way. So in a sense, that's the, the dead end you're talking about, where if we paint people 